Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecci Galanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides free stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that we are hosting this educational activity today on core stroke skills in a resource poor setting. And we have exceptional speakers that will be sharing their expertise on the topic. As per usual, before introducing today's moderator and, and speakers, we're gonna have a quick look at some of our housekeeping rules. Uh, we of course welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. We will have approximately 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, you can of course use the chat box to say hi, let us know where you're joining us from or leave your comments throughout the webinar. Also a reminder that the webinar is recorded and the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar and it will also be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy site. But we kindly ask you to fill in the evaluation survey for that, which will pop up at the end uh, on your screen so you can share your feedback. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce today's moderators. We have Dr. Lucy Sykes, who's a consultant, a stroke physician at Hampshire Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and part of the Wessex Ghana Gambia Stroke Partnership. And Dr. Albert Akpalu, who is head of the neurology unit at the Korlebu Teaching Hospital in Accra, Ghana. So Albert, the floor is all yours for your introduction. Okay, thank you very much and welcome everyone to this webinar. And um, this is our second webinar for this. This is the Wessex Ghana Gambia Stroke Partnership. Next slide. Next slide. So one in four adults will have a stroke during their lifetime. And in our part of the world, learning our core skills is very necessary. So I think we have to change the narrative from formal stroke units to have practical stroke units. So I think we need to see what your region needs. And there are so many opportunities for partnerships and skills training is very critical in this, in this format. So I want you all to visit our site at wgsstroke.org to get more information about what our partnership has been doing over the years. Next slide. Next slide. So we have a very exciting webinar today, several specialties which make the multidisciplinary team working an excellent one. Next slide. So topics, topics are going to discuss continent swallowing, positioning. This is an effort between Kodibutishina Hospital and the Edward Small Francis Hospital in the Gambia. Note your political role in your institutions if you want to set up a stroke unit, very important. So we look forward to excellent presentations and your questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. Um, it's my great pleasure we'll to introduce our first you speaker. To answer them live. Thank you very much, Albert. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker on, who's going to give us an overview of stroke care in West Africa. And this is Dr. Bertha Ecker, who's a neurologist working at the Edward Francis Small Hospital in the Gambia. All right, thank you so much. This is for this opportunity to talk about overview of stroke care in West Africa. My name is Dr. Bertha C. A. K. I'm a Nigerian, probably primarily working in Nigeria, but currently doing a sabbatical leave in Gambia. Next slide is my disclosure introduction. The most striking feature, World Stroke Organization said, the most striking feature is that the bulk of the global stroke body, 86% of deaths due to stroke and 89% of deaths occur in lower and lower middle income countries, of which West Africa subregion is part of it. I'm Nigerian, I work in Gambia, and we are part of this burden of stroke. So the burden of stroke, next, next slide. 
Okay, stroke has become reached epidemic proportions with as much as 12.2 million people worldwide estimated to have their first stroke this year. Over 110 million people in the world have experienced a, 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 a stroke. And this is the annual incidence. All the, the numbers are horrendous. Back home in Nigeria, we say every Nigerian knows or is related to at least somebody who has had a stroke before. That's how common it is. By the time you look through people you know, from your extended family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, church members, you know one person who has had a stroke before. Next slide. Next slide. Stroke mortality in Africa is also horrendous. From many studies in Africa, Ghana used to be as much as 4.9 to 50.3% of deaths, mortality, before with the uh, WSS collaboration, you reduce remarkably. The Medusa stroke in South Africa is at 3%. More recently, too, the, the numbers are still high. Dakar, Senegal, 38%, 41% in Gambia. East Africa has lower rates, 26.7 to 28.7%. Next slide. Back home in Nigeria, our case fatality rates are between 21 to 45%. Note what is that one of the studies from JOS, my study actually, 35% mortality of which 76.1% of those who died, died within the first week. And so this is a crucial period for stroke. Other studies, one in Lagos 2015, noted that there were 1,090 CVD cardiovascular disease rated deaths. Stroke accounted for 51.2% of that. And those are the other data that we see with very long, um, high mortalities. Next slide. The, the levels of stroke care is a pyramid. Medima healthcare below, essential stroke services and advanced. Next slide. Most of us in the West Africa are still on minimal health care. Just care in the local communities without coordination, no access to di diagnostic services. One, some of us have a bit more now, limited access to physicians, limited access, you know, and then thanks to the West's stroke partnership, who came here, we have been able to capture the basic training in swallow sprints and dysphagia management and in temperature management, and it has gone a long way. And that was most of what they also did in Accra, Ghana, that reduced their mortality rates. Next slide. Essential services, these are some of the things most of us in West Africa don't have access to this. We have one or two basic di diagnostic services. TPA, where I come from in Nigeria, country of 220 uh, people, we don't have up to five centers that can give TPA and other essential services. Next slide. Evidence-based care shows that there are three interventions that benefit at stroke patients. One of them is the use of TPA, which restores cerebral blood flow, the use of oral aspirin, which presents, prevents clots from developing and management in the stroke care unit. I particularly, next slide, I particularly love this slide that compared them. And you can see that, yes, though thrombolysis, number needed to treat is just 14, but you don't capture so many persons, only 10% in between all the indications, the time frame, availability of medication, only 10% of stroke patients can be treated. And they prevent only 15, you know, dependency and avoided deaths. But stroke care units, number needed to treat is 18. And you can treat as much a whooping 80% of persons. And so it's the number of deaths and dependency, you know, avoided is as much as 107. This excites me because it shows that it's the all hands on deck the nurses, the therapists, everybody pitching in. That's what the stroke patient needs. Next slide. And so that's what the stroke needs, a dedicated area, multidisciplinary team, all hands on deck. Next slide. Next slide. We have challenges in the management of stroke in West Africa. I classified them into awareness, access, and action. Awareness was a huge problem. People didn't even believe that it was a medical disease because our African belief is that it's a spiritual disease and should be treated spiritually. So stroke patients are rather go to traditional medicine doctors or go to churches, go to the imam. So we've done a lot of that. 
Now we have most of the problem now we have is access, late presentation of patients, access to the hospital, access to CT scan, the cost implication, and of course, actions to be taken, training of personnel, lack of stroke units, lack of medication. So those are the problems that we currently have. And so training of personnel, we want to also thank Wessex for helping us to do a lot of that, both in Accra and now in Banjo. Next slide. Prevention of complications of stroke is very important. Aspiration pneumonitis carries 100% mortality. In 15 years of being a neurologist who manages stroke, I've only seen one person survive. And I'm saying that is seen, I see 10, 15 stroke patients every week. And that's what I've seen. So we have a lot of time and the pressure sores. These are the complications. Next slide. Pressure sores, DVT, infections. And that's what the WSS collaboration team, their partnership has helped us to prevent this. We have, you know, evidence in the world. The nurses will talk a bit more about that. Next slide. Prevention of stroke is of paramount importance to us. Now that we're able to convince our people that it's a medical condition, we also convince them lifestyle modifications, diet, exercise, reduce alcohol, quit smoking, salt intake, and pharmacological. And so I love this slide. This is what we call, I call it the healthy West African diet. It makes up most of our food, fresh foods, non-processed, or well, minimal procession, eat our food, drink a lot of water. And so we keep telling them, oh, organize, change your diet, back to our African diet. It's a healthier you. Next slide, these are the pharmacological. The next slide, pharmacological, we say, know your numbers, your blood pressure, your, your blood sugar, cholesterol, these can be managed medically. And then in summary, we're still saying, there's a high burden of mort and mortality of stroke in West Africa. There's so much needed to do to reduce the burden, morbidity and mortality. We need our hands on deck. Prevention is a key because the best stroke is a stroke you never had. And finally, we are very grateful at what Francis Mottichin of Fredo Banjo is grateful to the Wessex Stroke Team for their partnership is, is in ensuring improved stroke care. I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eke, for that overview. And now we're going to try to bring this uh, uh, webinar to life by focusing in on a case presentation of a stroke patient that was seen at Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. And this is going to be presented by Dr. Siddhat Juf, one of our medical residents in Banjul. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Siddharth Duf uh, from the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital uh, in the Gambia. Uh, so today I'll be taking you through a case uh, presentation of a patient that we saw and then managed in the month of uh, January 2023. Um, next slide, please. Um, so she's a 62-year-old female uh, who presented uh, with a two, two weeks history of headache. And she was also found to be hypertensive a few weeks ago and then was, tra uh, was started on uh, hydrochlorothiazide. She also has a weak history of collapse at home. Uh, and then uh, two days later, I presented to a Brickhammer District Hospital um, with focal seizures, uh, where she was treated with uh, diazepam and then was later referred to, to the FSTH. So in the past medical history, uh, there is no history of diabetes. A uh, patient occasionally took uh, aspirin. Uh, as mentioned earlier, she was also uh, diagnosed of high blood pressure that, uh, that was two weeks ago, two weeks prior to presentation. So next slide. Um, so on, on presentation, so the patient's uh, blood pressure was uh, 120 on 60, which was pretty normal. Pulse was 74 beats per minute uh, and was regular. Uh, the respiratory rate was 20 cycles per minute. Uh, oxygen saturation on room air was uh, 99%. So patient was a febrile. Uh, the random blood sugar was uh, 9.1 millimoles per, per liter. Uh, so the systemic examinations, uh, the cardiovascular, uh, respiratory, and abdominal examinations were unremarkable. Uh, on CNS, patient had a DCS of 6 on 15, 
uh, pupils were equally reactive to light and there were no um, identified neurological uh, or neurological abnormalities. Next slide, please. Um, so we patient was admitted with a differential. So our differential diagnosis were a uh, stroke, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, cerebral malaria, meningoencephalitis, or uh, status uh, epilepticus. So next. So next slide, please. Yeah. So patient had, had a brain CT scan that was done. Uh, that showed uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage uh, in the right parietal region. Um, so that is showing on the on the image here as the hyperdense lesion on the right. So this actually is not the patient's uh, original CT scan, but it's a similar one showing uh, the, the hemorrhage in the right intraparenchymal right intraparenchyma hemorrhage. Next slide, please. So patient was admitted uh, at the intensive care unit. So initial management. This patient uh, included IV normal saline, uh, IV antibiotics uh, on calf drugs on sepon, flooding, IV phenytoin, IV dexamethasone, manitol frosamide, uh, ranitidine, metoclopramide, paracetamol, and uh, vitamin B. -co. Um, patient was also on enalapril and HCT. Um, uh, Simvastatin was also started uh, for this patient. Um, next slide, please. So on day two of admission at the at the ICU, um, patients GCS improved from six to twelve. Uh, NG tube and catheters were in situ, uh, inserted on admission. Uh, patient was also uh, started on uh, valproate. So between day two and day six, there were no significant changes. Uh, on day six, uh, IV manitol, frosamide, and antibiotics were were stopped. So the, the blood stain for malaria, this patient was negative, and the total white cell count on admission was eleven. Um, so, uh, so series of football counts were done, and the maximum white cell count she had was 14. So, on day 13 of admission, patient was seen by physiotherapists, and they mainly did uh, passive mobility uh, techniques. So, on day 14 of admission, patient improved. Uh, GCS was 15 on 15, and the tube was removed. Uh, the vitamin B complex was stopped, and patient was transferred to the female medical ward. Next slide, please. So on day 15 of on day 15 of admission, uh, patient uh, complained of uh, constipation. So this was in the female uh, medical ward. Uh, turning chart was started, and patient was drinking, uh, but was refusing to refusing to eat. And so on day 18 of admission, anti-epileptic medications were stopped, and because patient hasn't had symptoms for a while. Uh, on day 19, uh, assessment with the physiotherapy was done and then uh, patient had bladder training started. Patient was requesting food and then uh, since patient has improved, uh, so we're planning on, on discharging the patient. Uh, so that's the picture of the patient uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, so we can see the, the turning chart pasted on the wall there. And the patient is nicely seated in the middle of the bed uh, with the right hand nicely placed on the pillow. We can also see uh, a facial group on the on the on the left. So patient's left hand is placed on the you know, on, on the pillow. So it has a weakness on the left actually. Yeah. So we actually had uh, the permission to to display patient's picture. So that was it about the patient. So next slide, please. So at this point, we had training on the, the different. Uh, like positioning, swallowing, and continuous assessment of the patient. So the things that we did for this patient and the things that we could have improved on are uh, what are summarized in this in this slide. So for the positioning, so patient had uh, a turning chart in place and family were educated and the slide sheet were also being being used for this patient. So however, there was a delay in the referral of the patient to the physiotherapist and the uh, patient also, uh, there was potential to see the patient out of bed, which was not done until uh, on day 19. So for the swallowing, the ND tube was inserted in a timely manner on admission with the GCS of, GCS, GCS of six. Uh, however, patient ND tube was also removed in a timely way. Uh, but there was no documentation of the swallowing assessment uh, on the patient's folder. So for the continence assessment, so patient had bladder training prior to discharge, uh, and there was plan for, for, for catheter removal before discharge. So patient had constipation which was not uh, treated, and uh, that could have impacted on the 
on the credit management. Yeah, so that's that's all we have for, for this case presentation and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Juf. Now, one of the things that we acknowledge um, across our partnership is that uh, this particular patient actually did have access to ICU care at Edward Francis Small, but that's not available to uh, the majority of patients in these settings, um, maybe because those facilities are not available or because of other reasons such as financial. So what we focus on very much in our partnership is um, core skills of um, things that can be applied on general medical wards that make a real difference to patient outcomes. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So we've got three core skills presentations where we're going to go through a little bit of a patient assessment, how we've trained staff in these core skills and the effect that that's had for both patients and staff, starting with swallow. And I'm very grateful to Catherine, Isha and Josephine for the following presentation. So hello, uh, my name's Catherine. I'm a clinical specialist speech and language therapist in Bournemouth Hospital in the UK. Okay, my name is Josephine Anoa Ato. I'm a principal nursing officer with the Stoke Unit Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Accra, Ghana. I joined the project in 2014. Can you tell me about how it, back in 2014 you treated patients that had swallowing problems? What we were doing is to physically assess the patient or based on the patient's condition or history or their case note, you are able to tell that this patient would have difficulty swallowing. So then you pass an NG tube or find other means of hydrating the patient. What has changed now since I joined the project uh, is that now after doing all that, you go ahead to do a swallow assessment. And even before you uh, do the swallow assessment, you have to make sure that you position your patient properly in bed. You know, sometimes you need to support them with pillows, ask them if they are comfortable before you do the swallowing assessment. You do not immediately start passing NG tube. And, if they fail the swallowing assessment with water, you can proceed with the stages of diet, stage two, stage three, et cetera. And then you, anytime you're feeding, you need to make sure to assess if swallowing is getting weaker, is it getting stronger? So you document to know the progress. And this, we have trained all nurses who have had opportunity to work at the stroke units, students, interns. We've even gone beyond the hospital to other hospitals in the greater Accra region to train them to help manage stroke patients effectively and then to prevent complications. So this is what we have done over the years. Uh, and what about when patients leave hospital? Do they leave with an NG tube or how, how do they leave the hospital? Uh, some leave with NG tubes. So, we some bring in healthcare professionals, so we train them so that they can take care of the patients at home effectively. Sometimes we have to train patient families to be able to do NG tube feeding and even oral feeding so that patients do not go home and they will have aspiration and there will be complications. And we always give them a contact to call. If they have any challenges, they should call us for feedbacks and then we are here to advise them on what to do. Can you tell me a little bit about how the training from the Wessex Ghana Stroke Project was delivered? So we had leads who took us through the core skills and then they supervised what we did. We even had a log book where we were logged in and then any time that the Wessex team visited, they also what supervise us and they countersign because they will call you to interview you theoretically to be sure that whatever the lead has signed, you are able to do. And then practically we go to the world, they assess you and make sure that you really know what you are doing before they even countersign. And then we're giving certificates afterwards. So most of us here have certificates because we went through the training successfully. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Aisha Ture from the Gambia. I'm currently working at Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. Um, the female medical ward in internal medicine. And can you tell me how you've changed the way that you treat patients who have swallowing problems on your ward? Yes, um, 
prior to uh, the stroke team coming to the gamut, prior to this program, we used to have stroke patients. If the patient has difficulty in swallowing, we usually um, pass NG tube for the patient and feed the patient via NG tube. So sometimes um, maybe the patient might improve, but still has um, issues with swallowing. We sometimes discharge them with the NG tube. Thank God to this uh, program we have now, we treat patients differently. When we have a stroke patient, the first thing we do in order to know whether the patient can tolerate oral or not is to do swallowing assessment. If the patient passes the swallowing assessment, then there's no need for an NG tube. Otherwise, if he or she fails, we pass an NG tube. And also when the patient has improved, we, kept, we keep reassessing the patient for swallowing. Whether they have improved, they can swallow now or not, instead of discharging them home with the NG tube. Thank you. And how is the training being delivered? Thanks to Dr. Lewis and the team. We did training in the office, training in the ward, training with co-workers. We did some online training and some seminars with the, the stroke uh, program. So um, with the help of the training, I can see that there, there's a lot of improvement when it comes to stroke patients. And if a patient has some swallowing problems but, but don't need an NG tube, what will you do with those patients? Well, depending on the condition of the patient, uh, we keep monitoring the patient's vital signs, especially the blood uh, sugar level. So if the patient doesn't have any risk of um, hypoglycemia, we ask the patient what exactly do they need. Maybe they, they don't like the food we are giving them, or maybe they have some family issue. We try to solve that issue in order for the pa patient to be able to take in food. And looking forward into the future, what sort of needs do you feel you have next with regards to managing patients with swallowing difficulties? I think um, right now our main challenges is um, the nutrients, the food balance they need to have. And secondly, uh, we have issues with our bed. Sometimes when we don't have much staff, and especially when feeding a patient, you need to bring them in an upright position. Mm -hmm. um, they need to sit down most of our beds, the head cannot be rising up. So what we ask sometimes is to allow a colleague to sit behind the patient in order for the patient to be positioned well. And if we're sort of staff, we ask the escort to sit behind the patient in order to be able to uh, feed the patient. And even after feeding, the patient still have to sit for some time before we lay the patient down. So that is our main difficulty here. Thank you. Uh, that's really interesting to hear of all the changes that you've been making. It's a really positive story. Yes, sure. And we are working more. We are, we are, we are looking forward for more trainings and uh, looking forward in improving our stroke management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next um, core skill that we're going to look at is positioning. We just heard how important it is to get the patient into the correct position before you do a swallowing assessment. And our nursing and physiotherapy colleagues have been working really hard on getting staff trained up to be able to do this effectively, and also to, be, uh, to ensure that the patient is not exposed to the risk of pressure sores. So I'm grateful to Louise, Pender and Cynthia for discussing this topic. Okay, so my name's Louise Johnson. I'm a physiotherapist. I work in the UK. Cynthia's the lead physio on, on the stroke unit at Corlebu Hospital in Accra. Um, hello, my name is Penda Suare. I am the I'm lead physiotherapist in Gambia. So for our little section, we are just going to be talking about um, one of the core stroke skills, which is around positioning. Um, I think, Penda, were, were you going to say something about why positioning is important after stroke? Um, when you have stroke, you tend to have weakness and then you tend to have um, lots of sensation there. So with the positioning, it's, um, it brings the, it prevents a lot of things. It prevents contracture, it helps with the blood flow, and it helps the patient to regain um, their mobility as soon as possible. 
yeah great and and for us being able to sort of position people well is also one of the um kind of the precursors to be able to do other things like swallow assessments and preventing things like pressure sores and enabling people's ability to communicate and can you just tell us about sort of what the challenges are around positioning yeah our patients tend to stay longer in the hospital and they tend to develop pressure sores and all the things which um, prolong the treatment plan for these patients and then even after rehab for these patients were very difficult but when the project um, came in we were able to reduce pressure source and then we, with the chats we were able to do the toning by the nurses the physiotherapists and also even the patient escorts were able to do that so the patients we were able to prevent all those pressure source which was one of the main problems and also aspiration Patients later with this group, they had like um, aspiration pneumonia. Later, if they are admitted, the diagnosis would always come as aspiration pneumonia. So with that, with that positioning, they were able to, uh, we were able to um, reduce some of those things. And I think what we saw when we first started working was that lots of patients were, were nursed and were managed in bed and, and lying flat in bed. So this was about making sort of simple changes to that, that management. So um, at, at Call a Boo, we've been working on this alongside lots of other core skills for quite a long time. S Cynthia, do you want to just talk about like the approach you took at Call a Boo to, to improve positioning and some of the strategies that we used? We first conducted an audit and then an um, observation to understand what the current practice was. And then we took the next step to educate and then talk to the various levels of staff, and then also to get them to buy into um, the idea how important positioning was um, in preventing complications that is associated with um, prolonged um, immobility and leading to prolonged stay of our patients in bed. And then training was delivered to um, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, and then especially our nurses. We also introduced um, a positioning sheet or chart to serve as a guide for every member of the team involved in the care of the patient. Although it's a, like quite a, perhaps a simple thing, someone's positioning, actually a lot of work had to go in, didn't it, to making a, a change in practice. Yeah, was there anything else that you felt helped to improve sort of positioning over time on, on your on your stroke unit in Kolebu? Right, um, on admission, yes. Patient relatives were encouraged to bring extra pillows in addition to what the hospital already provided to help um, positioning our patients well. And then we also were able, in collaboration with the partnership, to get high back chairs, yes. We brought the patients out and then seated in the high back chairs. And then we also had studies to help aid the transfer of our patient from bed um, into chair. And then we also had slide sheets. So these were very useful. We identified a local carpenter who was able to produce two banana boards. You were fortunate that your hospital then obtained hoists as well, didn't they? So, yeah. um, and Panda mentioned this a little bit already, but are there other ways that you've kind of been able to demonstrate to your teams or to your hospital um, colleagues that things have improved? For the Ghana team, we had Ruth, who was our data assistant, yes. Right from admission, um, we take note or data on whether the patients came in with bed sores, um, subluxation, et cetera, these complications. And then over the period before they are discharged, she also comes in to check from um, the sheets that we have, whether the patient was on the ward developed um, pressure sores or subluxation. So we had data before and then after to be able to compare. Before we had quite a number of patients who had subluxations, but um, after the introduction of appropriate positioning and then engaging all levels of staff and then even patient relatives, the numbers have significantly reduced. And is there anything else that either of you would um, kind of recommend for other services? Um, change takes time. And then you always need a team lead who is willing, committed, 
to ensure that change takes effect. There should be a lot of engagement, a lot of communication involving all levels of staff. And I, that's the same wherever in the world you are, isn't it? Change takes time and perseverance. Did you want to add anything to that, Penda? Yeah, and then as far as here, we're still learning um, because we still have like this multidisciplinary team that it's not very um, still not the communication is still lacking but hopefully we hope to get there as soon as possible and then like we like we're still trying but we're still not there for us yeah and you started this work more recently than the team in, in Ghana have been working on this for a long time so so just just the last little bit was just to say what's next I mean we, we focus on sort of positioning first and in supporting people to be upright and they're possible to be out of bed and what do you envisage the next steps are after that so the next step is to get the patients to be able to do functional acts and activities and um, for instance once we have come in um, do our therapy and then we finally transfer the patient out of bed the ot then comes in to take the patients through basic um, activities of daily living like getting the patient to be able to feed to be able to brush their hair to be able to comb to be able to button get them to be functional again. great so i think just the message is that um improvement is continuous isn't it it's not like we ever get to the point where we've well we've done that and it's finished so the initial part was around positioning but actually then building on that is how we support people's physical recovery by then thinking about what what they can be doing more of and engage with once they are sitting upright or they're out of bed yes um and for us um we're still for the recovery part we don't have to see um after the patient is discharged from the ward or it's at the ward we the physios we do all of that for the patient so for us, it's a little bit different. And then the recovery also for the rehab, they come to our physio for our patients. Yeah, absolutely. And so your resources are different. And that's why like you, you both mentioned about involving family and escorts and other people and the nursing team so that, that everybody helps to contribute to this. But um, it's it's not not easy when, when you don't have the um, as many people to deliver things. And that's why change takes time. Thank you. Another very common problem after stroke is incontinence. And that's what Claire and Monica are now going to discuss. Okay. So, hello, everybody. My name is Claire Fulbright Scanlon. I am a nurse and I am a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Um, in the United Kingdom. Hello everyone, I am Monica Apia, a stroke lead, a principal nursing officer in charge of the stroke unit Kolebu Teaching Hospital, Accra, Ghana. Thank you, Monica. So we're going to talk a little bit about how continence care has changed in your stroke unit in Kolebu Hospital. And I wondered if you could start by telling me how you used to manage incontinent stroke patients before the training. Thank you very much, Claire. So initially, before the training, most of our patients were being managed in catheters. All our stroke patients who are incontinent were managed in catheters. So we were giving them urethral catheters and they stay in the catheter the whole period of admission until they have been discharged. This made the infection rates very high among our patients. And when they are going home, we take out the urethral catheter and there is no formal education or training to the patient carries, either they just go home like that. So these were some of the practices that we were doing before the training. Thank you. And so how are you, now that you've had the training, how are you managing your incontinent patients now? Thank you very much. So currently, we receive our patients through the Accident and Emergency Center. And on few occasions, we receive our patients, some of them directly onto the ward. 
when we receive our patients, we assess our patients to find out whether they are continent or incontinent. And when we find out that they are incontinent, we give them diapers. Those who come through the accident and emergency center usually comes with catheters. So when we receive them, we have to assess and find out, do they really need the catheter? Are they in retention? Do they have any kidney failures that we need to monitor their input and output? Do they have any benign prostate hyperplasia that they will need the catheter? After the assessment, if they don't have any problem and they don't really need the catheter, we remove the catheters and then we give them diapers. When we give them diapers, we visit them every two hours to offer bedpan, to change their wet diapers. We also turn them every two hourly in bed. We treat their pressure areas to prevent the risk of developing the ubiquitous ulcers. We also assist those who are conscious and alert to the washroom. We also offer commodes to those who have good trunk control at the bedside. We offer bed pans at typical toileting types, example, after meals, to enhance bladder and bowel training. We maintain our stool charts. And currently, we are using the Bristol stool charts to monitor our patient's bowel movement. We also maintain our fluid charts to monitor our urine output as well. Currently, there is an ongoing training for all staff and students who are on internship at the unit to make sure that they acquire skills in managing stroke patients. So these are the basic things we are doing to manage continents at the moment at the stroke unit. Uh, that, that's, that's lots of changes in, in that, Monica. So thank you for that. Um, what challenges did you have to overcome to be able to make those changes? Yes. So initially, we were not having enough staff to work with. Because when we look at the the, the, the good practices we are doing, it involves a lot of work and we needed more hands to do the work. So there was lack of staff at the initial stage. There was lack of training for the nurses to keep up with the good habit of turning patients and changing diapers frequently. There was lack of equipment. We were not having enough equipment. We were not having commodes. We were not having full chairs and steady to make the work easier for us. Infection rate was very high because our patients were most of the time in urethral catheters. Our patients were also developing pressure sores. Our patients were also developing pressure sores at that time. And then our patients, relatives and carers were not receiving any form of education so that they will do proper care after they have been discharged from the hospital. So these were the challenges that we went through before finally we had the training. Excellent. And how did the nurses adapt to this change? It has not been easy, but um, there is constant training, a constant monitoring and supervision that has helped us to keep up with the good practices that we are doing. So we have certain um certain tools that we are using to keep up with the training so we have a turning chart we have turning charts that we are using so every two hours we are turning our patients and we are documenting in the turning chart we have two charts as well to monitor our bowel movement to monitor our patient's bowel movement so the two charts helps us to keep up with our bowel movement monitoring. We also have fluid charts. The fluid chart also helps us to monitor our urine outputs 
whether our patients are passing urine or they are in retention. So these are the tools that we are using to monitor uh, care that we are rendering at the stroke unit. Thank you. And what are the benefits that you've seen? But there's all these changes. What are the benefits to the patients that you've seen? And are there any benefits to the staff? Yes, there has been a remarked benefit to our patients and to the staff as well. On the part of our patients, the rate of patients developing pressure sores has reduced remarkably. We don't have a lot of patients developing pressure sores, unless, of course, they, they come in with pressure sores developing already. So, bed sores has been a thing of the past for us. Infection rates, urinary tract infection, and any form of infection has actually reduced remarkably. Constipation has also reduced because we are monitoring. So, the moment we observe that our patients are constipating, we act fast to avert the situation. There has been increased bladder and bowel function post-stroke because of the bladder training that we commence from the stroke unit. And on the part of our staffs, there has been a greater job satisfaction. There has been a greater job satisfaction among our staff. And the unit has been has been marked a, 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 a standard care unit, you know? So patients are, are, are coming in from all over the hospital. Sometimes patients who do not even have stroke wish to be nursed at the stroke unit. The doctors wish the patients should be nursed at the stroke unit because we are giving a high standard of care to our patients. Excellent, thank so you. The benefits have been very great. Thank you, Monica. That sounds amazing work that you've been doing. Um, and I know that you've sustained this actually over several years now, which is, is really pleasing. So that, that's fantastic work. Well done, Corley Booth Stroke Unit. Um, can you, if you had to give a take home message to the people listening today, what would your take home message be about trying to help change things? Well, I would say we should have an I can do spirit. We should have an I can do spirit. We should be consistent with the good practice, and that is turning our patients regularly, changing our diapers regularly, fitting our pressure areas, training our staff. Very, very important. We need to train our staff. We have to monitor and supervise and make sure the work goes well. And this will, will, will make us go a very long way by rendering a high standard of care to our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that really informative discussion of uh, continence management and some of the changes that have been implemented through the partnership. I just want to summarise a little bit some of the key take home messages that we've heard from my colleagues. Next slide, please. So these are all things that we've heard from my colleagues over the last few moments. But I really want to emphasise this focus on the core skills, doing the basics right, things that can be implemented in any setting with the minimal um, amount of extra equipment required. We certainly haven't provided lots and lots of different things from the UK. The core skills that we've implemented with the teams have all been through education and training. And just to reiterate, um, Dr. Akpalu highlighted our website, wgstroke.org, where a lot of our resources are available. A thing that can make a huge difference to patient outcomes is the all hands on deck NDT approach and that I can do spirit. Approaching a challenge, thinking of a solution and then implementing it together. Making the most of the people and the resources that you have available to you locally and realizing that simple changes can make a big difference. Next slide. It's also important to remember that data and documentation are important. 
the two things that we've particularly found with data and documentation are it's the main way that we can demonstrate change from a situation where um, some of the core skills uh, were just being starting to be implemented to now, particularly in Corlebu and a, a, a growing uh, environment at Edward Francis Small, we're able to demonstrate that the outcomes for patients are improving dramatically through the implementation of these core skills. It does take time and committed leadership and communication and engagement amongst the team and also with your patients and their families is critical to success. Training and supervision of staff ensures sustainability. And as mentioned by Monica at the end there, an ongoing program of training um, is really important in making sure that these core skills are not lost if um, people move on from the unit, if staff move away from the unit. Thank you. Next slide. So thank you all very much for coming along and listening and participating. I can see that there's been lots of chat and questions, some of which I know my colleagues have been uh, rapidly typing answers to, but I think we've got time for a few questions and discussion now. So um, I'm just going to look at some of the questions that have come through. Um, and I wondered if um, either, I think Monica and Josephine are both on the call. I wondered if they wanted to say anything more about the sustainability of the training programme at Corlebu and how you manage when your nurses rotate away from the stroke unit, how you implement that training to keep everybody up to date. Yes, so with the training, we go through, we, we take our nurses through the basic training of the core competency skills. So when they come for clinical rotation or internship, or whenever we have new staff, we take them through the core skills training. It can take about four weeks to go through all the core skills training before the person can qualify to work effectively at the stroke unit. I will also add, so as we do the theory, we also do practical. So once they are working, you are supervising, you are inputting, and then you document, you sit down with them and find out their difficulties, where they need to change something, you come in, etc. So as they are working, you are still supervising and monitoring and documenting and also inputting for them to work effectively. Thank you very much, both of you. And I know we've spent a lot of time supporting you as the senior team to give you the skills to be able to implement those training programs and make sure that people have the appropriate competencies. And the other thing I think it's important to say is that we've shared a lot of the competency training across disciplines. So it's not only the nurses that are receiving this training, but also the physiotherapy team and at Corlebu, they also have um, an occupational therapy team and we've been really keen to make sure that everybody in the whole multidisciplinary team has a basic level aware of awareness of all the core skills. So everybody is trained to a certain level and then certain disciplines go on to a more advanced level. Um, for example, the physiotherapy team have a more advanced level with the positioning and the manual handling and the nursing staff have a more advanced level with um, continence and swallow assessment. But everybody's got that sort of basic background level to enable communication between the team and effective team working, isn't it? So the next question sort of following on from that, and I know that there has been some chat about this in, in the sidebar there. Um, Catherine, uh, who's one of our um, speech and language therapists, um, I wonder if you um, would be able to comment on um, the challenges of not having speech and language therapists in the multidisciplinary teams in West Africa and um, how we support the nurses to be able to do swallowing assessments effectively and safely. Catherine, I think you're muted. Oh dear, we can't hear you at the moment. 
Sorry, I'm not sure. Oh, there you are. Yes. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Um, it is a challenge, I think, not having a dedicated speech and language therapist within the team. I think there certainly would be capacity with all the patients for that role. Um, and but so part of our training has been to uh, disseminate to all the nursing staff about conducting swallow screening and managing these patients with swallowing problems. And I think someone asked in the chat about, you know, what to do if you don't have a qualified speech and language therapist. And I think there are some, some really uh, general things that you can do with all these patients that have had stroke problems that can improve their quality of life if they have swallowing problems, such as making sure they've all got really good mouth care, making sure that when they're fed that they're positioned in a really good upright position and that they're fed at appropriate pacing. Um, so even if you don't have a qualified speech and language therapist, there are some changes that you can make to how you manage a patient that can improve their quality of life and really reduce their risk of an aspiration pneumonia. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, I think that's it, isn't it? It's about employing those basics correctly mm -hmm. and not getting too hung up on some of the um, more specialist things that the speech and language yeah. team might do um, if they were available. And the other thing um, that we found is in um, Ghana and Gambia, it's been very difficult to get hold of um, uh, the resources to thicken drinks yeah. and to modify consistencies. Um, I don't know, Catherine, if you've got any comment about that. Yeah, I think uh, th thickening drinks is a, a bit of a contentious topic in the speech therapy world at the moment anyway. Um, and it's not always that beneficial. We know that if you do aspirate thickened drinks and they go into your lungs and that can be worse for your lungs. So having a really clean mouth and having water could, is better than aspirating a thickened drink anyway. Um, they do have their place and they are useful for some patients, but I wouldn't say that they are the most important thing in managing these patients with swallowing problems. And then with the food there, there are often modifications you can make to a patient's diet just to make it easier for them to chew and to swallow. So mashing it down and adding a bit more sauce to it so it's more moist, um, which can be done with any, any sort of foods consistency that you have available. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for one more question, which I'm going to address to Albert. There's two sort of linked questions, one about advice for hospitals with limited scanning resources and no access to CT or MR imaging and linked in with that. Um, what were the challenges um, with thrombolysis um, at the start of the project and currently? OK, thank you. Well, unfortunately, my, my video cannot show, but yes, the, I'll answer that there are resources with we have hospitals with thrombolysis. At least our hospital and two other hospitals can do thrombolysis and have an acute stroke unit, have an acute um, care unit now. We use uh, ten connected place, which is easier for us to use. Now, the... Okay, we are, for, we are still on. Okay, and yes, there's no excuse for us not to have a CT scan. So there's no score in the world that can tell you what an infarct is or what, um, what a hemorrhage is. So the new definition is that you need a CT scan. So the, we have to improve access to CT scan. At least in Ghana, in each region, there, there should be a CT scan operational now. Otherwise, you have to drive for an hour or two hours to get to the next CT scan, which is not good for acute stroke care. Thank you, Albert. Um, I think I know that everybody on this call will know this, but obviously it's it, it's impossible to provide thrombolysis treatment without a CT scan. So if CT imaging is not available, then thrombolysis is an absolute no-no. Um, but of course, any patient, whether they're thrombolyzed or not, whether they're an infarct or a hemorrhage, they will all benefit from the um, correct application of these core skills um, and their outcomes will all be improved, which is another, again, another reason why we've really focused in on the nursing angle, because we do appreciate that um, imaging is not always available. And even if I know at Corlebu, this is still sometimes a problem and it's a, it's a particular problem at um, Edward Francis Small 
um, that even though there is physically a CT scanner in the hospital, because of financial constraints, very frequently patients either aren't able to have a scan or that scan is very delayed. Um, but that shouldn't delay the good nursing care that is going to make a, a big difference to these patients not developing complications. So just I think we're going to wrap up shortly, but just to once again um, direct everybody if they do want more information or to contact um, the Wessex Ghana Gambia Stroke Partnership um, to our website, which is wgstroke.org. Um, and I'm now going to hand back to Laura for the final remarks. Thank you very much, Lucy. Wonderful interviews. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your warm participation in today's webinar. I hope you enjoyed these recorded segments that the team prepared. Um, and I want to thank them for, for preparing such a comprehensive webinar. They walked us through an overview of stroke care in West Africa. We got to see the management of a specific case. And then we heard about the three core skill presentations. So as mentioned, a recorded version of this webinar will be shared with all of you and uploaded on the World Stroke Academy site after you fill in the evaluation survey, which will pop up on your screens after the webinar has ended. In the meanwhile, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn so you can stay up to date for all of our upcoming educational activities. Our next webinar in the next slide you will see is a World Stroke Organization Global Policy webinar, which will take place on Tuesday, 18th of July. So we hope to see you there. Thank you again to the whole team and take care. Bye, everyone.